so welcome everyone uh, to ov talks so this is the second episode uh, of my new podcast that i started a while ago and uh, due to some uh, work constraints i wasn't able to continue so here we are now you know with the second uh, episode and uh, for this uh, episode i've invited uh, my friend from uh, australia uh, jenny mcbracken jenny is a uh, it's really street artist uh, uh, from australia so we'll uh, talk to her and know more about her work where she from how she started and everything so let's just you know introduce jenny and uh, get on with it so hello jenny how are you hi obaid i'm very well thank you so first of all thank you very much for taking out time uh, to join me for this uh, podcast of mine uh, so thank you very much my pleasure thank you for asking <laughs> yeah so we just uh, get into it then uh, so my first question would be for everyone listening i know uh, about you but for those who might be listening they might uh, not know about you so tell us about yourself where are you from what do you do and uh, so then we'll uh, just I'll uh, chip in with more questions if I have any. So just introduce sure. yourself. Where are you from and what do you do? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm from Australia, as you mentioned. I've been drawing on the street and doing specifically kind of chalk art, street art. I started a very long time ago. Um, '89, I think I did my very first piece of street art. Um, yeah. and that was pretty daunting cuz i was fairly young then and it was all very new i'd actually learnt to do it in sydney from a um lebanese artist who was doing it on the streets in sydney and he very generously took the time to teach me tips and tricks about where to go and how to set myself up and from there i went to germany and competed in the gelden street art competition which was then not only about 10 or not even maybe 5 years old um so it's it's the second oldest after um the grazi incontro oh god i can't say it in in italian but the grazi competition is the oldest and then the gelden competition is the second oldest pavement art competition in the world as far as i understand it um yeah and i i competed in that with my german friend roland and we won which was just a mind blowing thing to have happen um yeah so we kind of drew all over germany in celebration <laughs> we went on a a pastel rampage <laughs> which is pretty fun. Went to Berlin and drew on the Kurfürsten Damm there, which is kind of like the main street that connects East and West Berlin and that had only just opened and reunified then. Um and since then I've been doing festivals kind of all over um in lots of places in Europe. I've been to Florida to Sarasota and um and done lots of work in Australia. I left painting on the street to go and work in theatre and worked for a company doing backdrops for theatre okay. for um probably 10 years maybe just under 10 years and finished that after being the head painter at the Walking with Dinosaurs live experience show so I was part of the team that helped to design the skin of the dinosaurs so I don't know if you know of that show but they large life size so some of them are like three stories high the brontosaurus and the t-rex they're huge oh. um so it was really a challenge so we had to print up 2 kilometers of skin to cover the dinosaurs <laughs> which we made out of t-shirt material um yeah and other things <laughs> so yeah i've had a pretty varied career um i left that job to go back to doing my own artwork and kind of freelancing so back doing street festivals but also moving more into doing large scale murals because i used my uh the skills that i'd built up in the theater industry um and applied them 
to doing outdoor large scale artwork of various kinds. And that pretty much brings me up to today. I guess I've been doing that for the last 10 years. So uh, I have a question related to what you've uh, just told me. Uh, did you have like a formal art education from a college or uh, somewhere? I did. I did go and study. Um, I studied a Bachelor of Fine Arts at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Uh, but I was straight out of school and I really didn't have a well-formulated idea of what I wanted to do except that I wanted to learn how to paint because I'd always drawn. I'd always done a lot of black and white work and I had no idea how to use colour. So although I got accepted into a a quite prestigious drawing course I turned that down to go and study painting um and in the end I didn't actually pass that course <laughs> I, I failed third year twice <laughs> not so much because the work wasn't good I was just really bad at administration and okay. you know I so the first year I had an exhibition 600 kilometers away when things were supposed to be being assessed, which was just really silly timing. <laughs> um, so things like that. But anyway, yeah. So I studied for four years and I learnt bits and pieces. Um, but then straight out of that, I went and was an, the art director for a little company that did uh, blackboard menus for pubs and restaurants and um so I was working nine to five drawing and designing for that. And I did that job for two and a half, three years. And I learned more doing that than I had in my four years at art school. <laughs> it's really just practice. And I, I think at that stage in the eighties in at art schools, there was a kind of crossover period and a lot of certainly the school that I was at, they were much more interested in conceptual stuff and they weren't teaching practical work at all we did life drawing and that was really the only practical training I had there were other schools in Australia at the time that were doing it but um yeah not being great at administration I and I was really shy and it was all very like it was a bit daunting at the time so I didn't I didn't look as far and as hard as I could have I kind of regret that now but you know, that's all right. I learned in other ways and I learned on the job and I learned just by doing, basically. <laughs> I forget. So, uh, so what, what is the art scene like uh, in Australia? Like, uh, since you've been uh, doing street art for quite a while now, so what's the street art scene like in Australia? Like, do you get a lot of work, street art related work, or like festivals happen? Because we know there are a lot of festivals in uh, Europe and certainly America, but uh, do you guys have festivals or uh, more opportunity for street artists in uh, Australia or uh, what kind of art scene is there? It's, well, it's limited by the size of the population for a start. I mean, we only have 24 million people in Australia, which is not a lot. Mm. I mean, you know, in Europe you've got, hundreds of millions of people and in America there's you know also many many people the the scene between Europe and America is very very different like in in Europe you can you get paid and you can earn money and so it it supports I think um it supports artists who can make a profession out of it whereas America it's very much more an amateur um thing because you don't get paid uh, and I think that changes the nature of the festivals a little bit. And there, there's not one that's better than the other. It's certainly easier to go where you're going to get paid and support yourself because otherwise, certainly from Australia, it's a big outlay for a ticket to get to the other side of the world. Um, and then to spend all that time there, it becomes a very expensive prospect. Um so that's a very, and in Australia, it's very different too. Like I think we're probably more in line with the American model, although we would pay artists 
to come here. There haven't been, there have been a number of festivals over the period of time that I've been doing street art work. So there was a couple of festivals that ran for consecutive years in the 90s in Melbourne, street art festivals, both for artists but also for street performers, so jugglers and all of those kind of street performing um, people. And that was, so in the 80s, in the 90s, it was very vibrant. There were a lot of festivals. There was festivals in a number of cities around the country. So it, it meant that artists could come, all the different kinds of performing artists or street artists could come from Europe or America mm. and it would pay for a tour. But that kind of stopped in the at the turn of the century and it's it's kind of different now and I'm not quite sure why that happened um so there's been a couple uh Zest events that I do work with now Andy from Zest events set up a festival a street art a pavement art festival in 2013 and so that was the kind of most recent and the only street art festival street drawing festival um for pavement art in australia there are now in australia there's quite a lot of mural festivals Mm -hmm. so um street art on the wall rather than on the floor and in australia there seems to be it's 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 a little bit more clicky in, in Europe, I noticed there's a lot of crossover. You can draw on the street, you can draw, you can paint on the wall and there's no kind of judgment. It's, there's, there's no, oh, you're not a real street artist because you do it on the, you know, you use pastels. Um, whereas here there's a little bit of that attitude, which is kind of a shame and it's very limiting. Um, so I've managed to do that crossover, but I think a lot of other people have struggled and even, you know, for me, it's been hard um, just cracking into that kind of scene. Uh, but, you know, you get out there, do the work, and it speaks for itself, and that's how you, that's really the way to do it. Right. Interesting. Uh, since uh, you've been painting for a while now and uh, you travel the world, you know, you've painted in different regions. Uh, you've also painted in the Middle East, uh, as well as Europe and America, and you, you're based in Australia. So uh, how different you, you know, you've uh, found uh, the, you know, audiences like you've been explaining that uh, it, it is a little different in Australia and uh, in Europe and uh, in America, so mm. how uh, different is it in uh, like you painted in Middle East? I think uh, you, you've been to Dubai Canvas as well. Yes, and yeah, which was fantastic. That was a great experience. I think you've painted in Qatar as well. Yes, yes, I did. How different uh, is the scene uh, or your experience of working in uh, Middle East has been? from uh, as compared to uh, Europe and uh, America or Australia. And similarly, uh, how the public's reaction has been. Like uh, for myself, when I, I, since I'm based in Pakistan and uh, most of the work that I do, it's in Pakistan. So when I started, you know, uh, doing the work in public, so I, ha- I had a lot of difficulty uh, in explaining to the public that what this art it, the art is because uh, you know it's, these are 3D art is distorted and it's uh, seen from one one point and you have to use a camera or a lens to you know see the correct illusion and then people used to question that there is something wrong with the technique that the uh, drawing is uh, or the art is not uh, correctly seen from the naked eye. So how has your experience been uh, from, uh, you know, you've been painting in the from the 90s and uh, then 2000s and then now in, the, in more recent times when so, 3D art is more popular and people are more aware. So how has uh, it evolved for you and the interaction with people has changed? So kindly tell us about it, how it has changed over the years. 
The biggest difference, the big sorry, the biggest difference is the uh, the development of digital technology. That's what's really made street art and particularly three D and illusion art just explode. Um, I was toying with doing that kind of stuff on the street in uh, in the nineties, and I was doing, but I was doing primarily single point perspective. So hole in the ground stuff. I wasn't doing so much anamorphic and fully distorted things. Um, Cause that, at that stage I was <laughs> being in Australia and suffering from distance from everywhere else. And I hadn't actually at that stage traveled to the rest of the world and seen it anywhere else. I thought I was inventing it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> but um, so I was working it out for myself then um which was it was good it was a big challenge but it was really hard without digital technology I mean I had to do it really the old-fashioned way I'd stand here and then I had to run there and check how it looked and then I'd go back here and you know there was it was it was just a lot of legwork and a lot of correction and it just took a lot longer um and as soon as digital technology was developed it just made the whole scene explode mostly because it was much easier to share images like I'd heard about people like Kurt Renner and other European artists kind of whispers on the grapevine that I'd hear from other artists and other people so oh, have you seen that guy I've seen his stuff I saw it in Europe and and I never like I'd never been in the right place at the right time and that was that was the key you had to be in the right place at the right time prior to digital technology but then once you could share it on the internet and um, capture it and, you know, it was, it was much, much easier to share those images. And so that has been a huge, huge change. Um, the other difference is that it does, it, it allows people to see it because you've got a screen that's live. You can hold that up. I mean, you can use lenses, you can use um, other techniques that help people see the distortion. And I've used all of those things and they all work differently, but the screen is the thing that unfailingly captures it because it reduces the actual depth and the drawn image to the same 2D plane. And if you've got it right, then it's just magic. Um, and that's, that's the thing. Yes, I have had the same experience you've explained where people will be standing at the wrong side of the picture going, this is very nice, but have you seen the 3D pictures that people do? <laughs> Just come around here and have a look from this point. And um, I don't know if you've been asked, but I have been asked genuinely, which I have still struggle to understand, whether I use special 3D paint to paint 3D images. <laughs> Okay, uh, no, I haven't been asked that one yet. <laughs> and I know a number of people have been asked it, so it's a question that's out there, but it's, it's yeah, that's, that's quite amusing. And, yeah, it, that's a big difference. I think audiences in Europe, because of the level of exposure, because it's a lot more common, there are many, many cities where it's been allowed for a very long time. It has a history... Uh, and so the audiences are much better educated. They understand the principle. They they kind of know the rules. They know what to expect. They know certainly that there's, you know, a viewpoint that even if it's not 3D, there's a point at which the picture will look the best. Um, and, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of an established relationship between the artist, the street artist, and the audience. And America is is getting there, but America and Australia are quite similar in that our audiences, I think, are because we're newer countries, they don't have the long history of like established artwork from thousands and thousands of years ago. I think it really makes a difference. And so we have a lot of people who's, you know, their the most of their art experiences the Christmas calendar or the nice print that they get and they're not exposed to real art and watching artists and like produce work over a number of days and most of those people are like oh my god this takes so long how do you do it 
<laughs> so that's always interesting. Or conversely, if you really like, if you've got something that you're really slamming out and you've got it all lined up and it comes out and you've got a team of people who work it, that's the other thing. Oh my God, you did this so quickly. How did you do it so quickly? So there's, there's, it's, that's one of the things that I personally find most rewarding is offering that experience to people, inviting them into your art process by doing it in public and letting them see and letting them watch and engage and ask questions. Um, yeah, there's generally I've often thought of having a list of questions that have been asked so many times you should read this before you ask any questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when it rains? What happens when, you know, does it get washed off? Do people come and graffiti over it? All of those questions could be very, you know, you need to have a handout that you give to people. <laughs> so that's yeah. very, very interesting, actually. Uh, I've had... Oh, I, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I forgot. I didn't, I didn't mention. So the difference between all of those places and my experience in the Middle East. Yeah. Was in the Middle East, it, it's, it's a very new thing. Like they've, I think it's been seen in Europe and America and then imported there as an experience they want to share with audiences. And as a result of that, it's very controlled because it's a, it's a product that's being imported. It's not something that has evolved in a natural way there. And I think you're one of the few people who's like started doing it in your own country and are developing kind of a practice that is becoming very it's you've got a lot of local influence in it you can see that it's got a long a strong regional flavor and I think that's really important because all of this stuff like Dubai Canvas is a fantastic and amazing festival but it's all imported they are using local artists which is great um but it's like I mean it's kind of just on the ladder of kind of artistic development. It's like Australia and America are still pretty new and we have quite uneducated audiences in, the, in you know, these new areas. And I think it's, it's all about audience education, basically, mm. and exposure. And the more they're exposed, the more educated they are in a particular art area. And, yeah, and they become exposed to kind of broader ideas and so they can, they can take in more. Yeah. Right, right. So, uh, so do you uh, have like, uh, what's your design process like? Like uh, when you're creating a mural or a 3D artwork on the floor or on the wall, what's your design process like? How do you like start it? Do you like generally when you're doing a commercial project, you generally are given a brief by the client that uh, you have to, uh, you know, follow these lines to create artwork. But uh, for, work, for the works that you do in the festivals or the works that you do on your own, what, what is your design process like? How do you like come up with the idea? Do you like, like I was uh, talking to Tracy, she keeps, uh, uh, you know, a diary or a journal, she, you know, constantly whenever an idea comes to her she just notices it down and then lets it develop over the time so do you have a similar practice or uh, like how do you come up with ideas and then from idea to execution what's what is your process like like do you create models like i've seen some artists uh, like Andres Vera in from Mexico. He generally creates models when uh, and photographs them and then you know he paints them. So what is your process like? It's very broad and it's very eclectic and it very much depends on each piece. I have my process has evolved a lot over the years. Um, as I said, I started pre-digital. So in those days, I would do a lot of sketching beforehand. I would gather reference images and work up. I always started with an, with an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and I've always had themes that I work around. Like I like to kind of explore concepts 
about that are relevant in society at the time, um, whether it's environmental or social or some kind of concept that I just want to explore telling a story, creating a story around that will invite people in. Interaction is always a big part of that, which is one of the reasons I just love 3D stuff. So I'll be working out how I can create an environment that invites uh, audience members into. And I started off, the more complex I got, the more I would build models. So for figures and I did a piece for the first Sarasota festival that I went to, which was a number of acrobats forming a peace sign. And that was really complex anatomically. And, and also I wanted, I needed to get the shadow right to make it stand up because so much, as you will probably realize, so much of making an anamorphic piece work is actually making the shadow correct so that when you have real objects standing next to your drawn object, the light matches and it tricks the eye. So, yeah, models were invaluable. I've used a lot of those. Um, now I also employ uh, various Photoshop designs and I'll interplay between doing sketches, making models, piecing that all together digitally and then working with the distortion that I need to do either with grid or scribble grid um, to expand it and put it on the on the whatever surface it's going on whether it's horizontal or vertical or both <laughs> yes. yeah so, so yeah it really depends on the site and depends on the um on the complexity of the piece i guess right so, since now for for the last uh, which i mean almost like two years now or the world is experiencing uh, coronavirus or COVID situation. So how um, COVID has affected your art practice? Like, has it affected your art practice or uh, not? Or if it has, so how have you adapted? Or, uh, well, know? up until COVID hit, I was primarily doing mostly big commissioned pieces and I was spending so much time traveling around doing those or preparing for those that I had very little time to spend in the studio. So I've really welcomed that time of just getting my studio practice up and happening. Um, and I've got a solo show, which will be the first solo show I've had in many, many years coming up uh at the start of 2022 so i'm looking forward to that and i'm working hard on that at the moment um australia was really lucky because we as an island it's much easier to kind of close down the borders whether that's a good or a bad thing um it has definitely meant that we managed covid to a hugely successful degree until just recently delta being so much more infectious has broken down that barriers and is now spreading rapidly here. Um, so where it's, it's changed Australia. So we were many, we were out of lockdown probably before most countries in the world and able to go back to relatively normal life, except for small areas of the country that were, that had to stay closed. Um, yeah. The last three months, has been back into kind of semi-lockdown, so back into the studio. Although, yeah, I've been able to, because it's, it's I, visually it reminds me of running down a football field dodging meteors. <laughs> it's like <laughs> are you, you have to kind of dodge and weave to get to make it through the COVID lockdown kind of map. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I have been able to do some work but vastly limited and really appreciating the studio time. Right. So, so we are, you know, coming towards the very end of our, uh, this discussion, interesting discussion. Right? So I have like one final question for you. Since you've been involved with, uh, you know, street art or 3D art in particular for a very long time now. 
so where do you uh, see it uh, heading like uh, for me in my country as there are not many uh, opportunities to uh, you know work in public with these kind uh, of murals or artworks with 3d art in public so uh, i have to you know and they're like couple of other artists so we have to like adapt and uh, since now i'm moving my or changing my art practice into you know more gallery oriented art practice art that could also be displayed in uh, galleries so i'm changing my compositions according to that and you know using surfaces dif now differently than i used to do before so where do you see uh, like this art uh, moving in the coming future I think uh, there'll always be a place for live art. It's um, the good thing about, uh, particularly if it's uh, more permanent rather than temporary, mm. uh, it's something that can be painted and left for people to discover. So in the new world where we're maybe discouraging or audiences it is something that can still be out there that people can interact with maybe just on a slightly um less less densely populated way uh but yeah i think i mean there are a number of reasons to to move into gallery spaces and i think it's possibly a way of evolving many artists practice i think separate from COVID, it's probably something that a lot of artists, if they've been going, like working for a long, long time, it often ends that way because street art is temporary and there's something very beautiful and very precious about that. It's all about the experience. It's a moment in time that comes and is gone. Um, and so it'll always stay fresh. That's why I think there'll always be a place for it in the world of, in one form or another. I mean, I think digital augmented reality and virtual reality will probably end up playing a greater and greater part and possibly artists working with screens set in the environment perhaps rather than paint is going to become a bigger thing as that technology is becomes more available and cheaper and more accessible to artists potentially i could see that happening i mean i look at the work that leon kia does and that's definitely got a big following and it's a, it's a really cool addition to any painted art is to have that option of making it come alive yeah and i can see a lot of people being interested in exploring that and there's we had um, an exhibition here in Australia at the Melbourne, uh, the Victorian National Gallery, which was by a well-established and serious gallery artist that involved a screen and, and was kind of a virtual reality representation of, of amazing spaces and it had a 3D element to it. So it incorporated a lot of ideas from street art but then had taking it into this new realm and new space. So I think it, it's, there's, there's going to be a lot of expansion and exploration in the digital world of 3D and illusion art. But street art will always be street art, I think. So it'll, it'll, it'll be there because it's a, it's a space that invites art basically i think it may or may not be approved of and it may or may not be legitimate but i think i mean legitimate in the eyes of established people who manage the streets but it's it's always legitimate art if it's out there and it's an expression and it particularly you know if it's eye catching and and catches people's imagination yeah yeah right so thank you very much jenny for taking our time uh, my pleasure and uh, you know it's been an interesting discussion uh in talking with you and listening to what your uh, 
journey was all about and how you you know started and where are you now so it was great you know talking to you and i hope we can you know do part two of this as well sometime uh, in the future and connect again and talk again so thank you very much for you know, it would be great thank you abate it was it's been an absolute pleasure